with his wife. David makes a vow that not only is he giving God praise, but he makes a vow that he's going to do it again. That's what I like about it. It's, it's right here. It's right here in the text. That, it's right here in the text. If you don't believe me, verse 22, and he says, and I will humble myself even more and humiliate myself even more. He makes the conscious decision that even though this annoys my wife, I'm still going to give God praise. And I'm just curious tonight, is there anybody at church that can say, if it annoys you, oh well. If it irritates you, oh well. If it aggravates you, oh well. If I'm too noisy, oh well. David's praise, David's praise is one where he disregards his position, is one where he disregards the public, it's one that was predicated on God's past performance, it's one that is personal and persistent. But not only that, not only that, not only that, David makes it clear that there's a story behind his praise. David could have easily said, honey, I'm shouting because the people were. You got folks like that. You shout, I shout. You run, I'll run. You sit, I'll sit. You worship, I'll worship. You gossip, I'll gossip. You a preacher now, I'm a preacher now. You got a group? We got group. You got a church? Come to my house. We got a church. You got people that make decisions based off the actions of other folks. But not even, what I like about David, his explanation to his wife clearly indicates that there was a story behind his praise. David references the fact that he was recently made king. But in my mind, if I'm allowed, to use my imagination, David, mine went down memory lane. And in his mind, I'm almost done. In David's mind, going down memory lane, perhaps David made a stop at 1 Samuel 16, when David was merely a shepherd boy. And the Bible says that David was tending to his father's sheep. And while tending, oh, we at church tonight. While tending to his father's sheep, the Bible says that out of nowhere came a lion. That lion took the sheep. David went back and struck the lion. God delivered David from the hands of the lion. I just believe that when that Ark of the Covenant was entering the city, David might have thought on Psalm 16. But not only that, David might have also thought about in Psalm in Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, when not only did God deliver him from the hand of the lion, but one day when he was tending to his father's sheep, there came a bear. And when that bear came and took the sheep, David went and struck the bear, and God delivered him from the hands of the bear. I'm not sure, maybe David made a stop in the chapter right before this, when they were looking for somebody to replace King Saul, and here God finds favor and little old ruddy David. He decides that David, who didn't have the best past, is still qualified to be king. I just believe that David was saying he had a story behind his praise. And I came tonight to emphasize to somebody that it ain't just David. Baby, I have a story behind my praise. My story didn't necessarily begin 
musicians, I'm ready for church now. <laughs> My story didn't necessarily begin with once upon a time. My story did have three little pigs. Sometimes I had four little pigs. Sometimes I had five little pigs. And every now and then in my story, I had to deal with some big bad wolves. There were some times in my story when I wanted a prince, but I ended up with a frog. There were some times in my story when I felt like Rudolph with a red nose. People laughed at cute. People talked about cute. There were some times in my story when I had to deal with depression. There were some times in my story when I felt like I was abandoned. There were some times in my story when I felt that I was empty. There were some times in my story when I longed for my daddy. There were some times in my story when I had to struggle through college. There were some times in my story I had tears rolling from my eyes. There were some times in my story when I could sleep at night. There were some times in my story seemed like there was always trouble. But I came to tell somebody I've got strength from my story. And I'm just curious tonight, is there anybody that can say there's a story behind my brain? My teacher taught me that any good story has got to have a conflict. Nobody wants to watch a movie, a TV show, read a story that has no conflict. Here's what God is saying to somebody tonight. Your story has a conflict, but that conflict is never the conclusion. There's no way you guys heard me. I said, your story has a conflict. Yeah, I appreciate you, mama. But that story, that conflict is never the conclusion. Cancer can be the conflict, but it won't be the conclusion. Unemployment can be the conflict, but it won't be the conclusion. Depression can be the conflict, but it won't be the conclusion. Trouble can be the conflict, but it won't be the conclusion. that I'm almost done don't worry not only that my teachers one day one day my teacher said well I'm teach I'm gonna teach you the writing process here's your word Bernard teacher told me I'm gonna teach you the writing process she says when you start writing you always brainstorm first brainstorm and then you write your story you brainstorm and then you write your essay so we were writing stories one day we were writing essays one day and I wrote mine my teacher said I'm going to take you through the writing process after I had read my story she told us all oh, pass your paper to your neighbor I passed my paper to my neighbor. She said, now each of you has each other's paper. Read their story. If you like it, leave it there. If you want to add something, add it to it. If you want to take it away, take it away. All the kids follow suit. This angered me, though. I wanted nobody touching my story. I didn't like this, this rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't like this, this troubled my spirit, but I, but I obeyed my teacher. Right. I began to write on my neighbor's work. 
finally, she said, now pass that page to the other neighbor. Now my page is two people down from me. She says, now read the story. If you like it, leave it there. If you don't like it, take it away. And if you want to add to it, add to it. We did that. Then she said, pass the sheet again. At this point, I'm about to lose it. <laughs> I can't take it no more at this point. She says, pass it again. We pass the paper. She says, now, read the paper. If you like it, leave it there. If you don't like it, take it away. If you want to add something, add to it. At this point, I lose all control. Ms. Williams, you let all these people write on my story. You let all these people take stuff out of my story. Add stuff to my story. I don't want them to read my story. She said, Q, this is a part of the writing process. I said, Ms. Williams, I don't understand what you mean. She says, this period in the writing process is called revising and editing. Yeah. 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 This is an opportunity for you to use information from your peers. I said, ma'am, I really don't care what it's called or what it's for. I don't like people writing on my story. I don't like people taking from my story. She said, Q, just hold tight, just trust me. Next she says, pass the paper again. We passed the paper again until our paper had went to every kid in that room. Finally, my story made it back to me. At this point, Earl, my story is completely ruined from my perspective. There have been things added to my story that I never intended to be in my story. There have been things taken from my story that I never intended to be taken from my story. The characters' names had been changed in my story. The locations had been changed in my story. I explode and I say to the teacher, look what you let them do to my story. She says, baby, this is the writing process. Now it's time for the final step. That was the revising and editing, but you're still in charge of the final copy. I said, you're still in charge of the final copy. There has been some stuff taken from your story, but if you want it back, take the pen and put it back. There's been some stuff added to your story, but if you don't want it back, take the pen and erase it.
depression was in your first copy. Yeah. The depression was in your first copy. Yeah. The sickness was in your first copy. Yeah. The sadness was in your first copy. Yeah. The sickness was in your first copy. Yeah. But I came to tell somebody, write your final draft. Yeah. story behind my prayer. You ought to just tell somebody you still have the pen. And I want to tell you something. I'm through preaching, Mike. I'm through, baby. Let's just give me some major worship course. That's fine. I want to encourage somebody tonight. If you don't watch yourself, you'll make the mistake I made mad and depressed yeah. mm -hmm. during the revising and editing period yeah. because if you don't watch people no. folks won't ever put the pen on their paper they won't ever they won't ever put the pen on their paper yeah. they ain't brainstormed for their paper uh, yeah. they hadn't wrote their first copy They'll never put the pen on their paper, but they can tell you all about your paper. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't watch yourself, you'll live your story based off of stuff that other folks have written. You'll live your life based off of stuff that other folks have put in your story. But I want to tell you tonight, you're in charge of your final copy. You're in charge. If you don't like how it looks, change it. If it don't sound right, change it. If the character's names ain't right, Change it. Yeah. If the locations ain't right, change it. And might I emphasize tonight, the conflict is necessary, but it's never the conclusion. Pick up your head tonight. That's the spirit of heaviness. Let me tell you something. We no longer live in a world where depression only hits teenagers. Yeah. Come on here. There are folks that see your citizens who are depressed. Come on. Yeah. Folks who are senior citizens who are wounded. Yeah. But let me tell you something tonight. The pen is in your hand. Yeah. And every now and then, to strengthen your paper, to strengthen your story, my teacher taught me it's okay to use a source. Yes. It's okay to use a source. I asked her what that meant. She said, if you need something to help your story, go find a book. Yeah. yeah. Go find a magazine. Yeah. Go find an encyclopedia. Yeah. Take something good out of that and add it to the story. Yeah. Can I tell y'all what I did tonight? I got to a place where I didn't like my story. I wanted to use a reference from an outside source. And guess what I did? I asked Paul, I asked Paul, I used Paul, he encouraged me and said, Q, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. My paper still wasn't strong enough. I needed another source. David said, Q, I sought the Lord. Yeah. And he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. I needed another source, and Joel the prophet called me one day and said, Q, whosoever called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I needed another source one day. There's a woman with an issue of blood. Said, Q, if you can just get past people. Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it, that's it, people. I came to minister tonight. If you can just 
as people, if you can just overlook obstacles, then God can make it happen for you. I needed more sources, and somebody wrote in the Psalms that weeping may endure for a night, but joy. How many have it tonight? Joy comes in the morning. I want to encourage you tonight. If your story is not right, you have the pen, but don't overlook good sources. Yes. We should have said amen. amen. Don't overlook good sources. Don't confuse your rough draft with your final copy. God bless you.